um, conditions, so basically if statements, uh, loops, and apply function. I think we had the apply function one in code, I think, last week. And I want to just tell you more general what that means and how you can, can use that. Conditional statements are really like in almost any other programming language. There is an if construct where you can uh, execute code under the condition. For example, if you see my variable x gets a value 12, then I can ask, is x more than 10? If yes, then the first block will be executed. Blocks are with, with curly brackets. So for example, cat means print it to the screen. It will just say x is more than 10. Uh, if this is not true, then it will print the thing in the else statement, right? So that's pretty straightforward. There's one important thing for R, which is that this expression here, x is greater than 10, has to evaluate into a single logical value. It has to be true or false so that it can decide, should I do the first one? If it's true, I do the first one. If it's false, I do the second one. And the reason why that's problematic for R is because we know that each variable in R is actually not a single value. It's a whole vector, right? Potentially, x might be 15 values. And if I compare those 15 values with 10, I might get 15 true or false values, right? And then R gets kind of confused. Should I take the first one? Should I take when, if everything is true? Um, so we have to be very careful here. In our case, it's not a problem because x is a very special vector with only one value. So we get only one logical, and it, it really works. And it will really print, in this case, x is greater than 10 because 12 is more than 10, right? OK, now let's do the problem with more than one value. So x could be a vector with 12, 16, and 3. And now, if I would just say if x is greater than 10, then x is greater than 10 would evaluate in true, true, and false. And the if statement would be unhappy, because there's three different true values, and it doesn't know what to do. So what we often do is we actually want to know if all of those evaluate for true, or, all, or, or if any of them evaluates for true. And there's functions called all or any. They just take a logical vector. All tells you it's basically a logical and if all of them are true. And any is a logical or, which says if at least one of them is true, then, then it will still work. So for example, if all x is greater than 10, which is not the case because 3 is not greater than 10, then it would write all values in x are greater than 10. It doesn't write anything because it fails here, right? Uh, and then if you say if any x is greater than 10, that's true because the first two are greater than 10, then it will say there is at least one value greater than 10, and, and that's, that's what it says, right? Um, so there is a little bit, thing, a, a little, you need to be a little bit careful with, with this here. And it get, goes even one step further because the logical operations, that's an OR. In most programming languages, you have ORs either as this single line or double line, and the same thing with AND, it's either one of those AND symbols or two. Uh, and they, even in regular programming languages, mean slightly different things if you have one or two in there. And for R, the definition is the following. If you do one of the OR or N symbols, then it's a pairwise logical OR, which means it takes the first element here, the first element here, does a logical OR, right? So false and false, it's going to be false. True and true, it's going to be true. True and false, it's going to be true. And you get spec three values, right? For each pair here, you get a value. This is good for us if we want to do something vectorized. If we want to just like do three ors in one go, that's what we can do. But it would be bad if we had this in our if statement. So <clears throat> what we usually do is we use in if statements always those two or symbols. And what it really does is it makes sure that it only takes the first element to the left, the first element from the right, and gives us only one result which is what our if statement wants. But the bad thing here is it ignores, it ignores those values, right? The second and the third value. But it guarantees that if doesn't get unhappy because there's more than one logical value in there. OK, so far so good. And is the same thing. You would use one end here and two ends there, and, and it would still work. So that's great. Loops. Loops look at least, or at least the concepts are very similar to other programming languages. Of course, every programming language has some sort of counting loop, right? Because we count a lot. So we have this here as well. It's the for loop. The syntax is slightly different. It is always for, then a variable name, in, and a sequence. So the sequence is 1 through 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And for each iteration, i gets the values in order. So for the first iteration, i gets 1. For the second iteration, i gets 2 and so forth. And I think in Java, probably, there is a for each loop or something that's very similar 
or with iterators, I guess it's very similar to, to this one. If you don't know those programming languages, don't worry, just concentrate on R. So that's how you write it. So for example, if I want to sum up all the values from one to five, what I would do is I would make x zero, then make a loop that goes from one through five. So I gets the values from one through five, and then I just always add i to x and overwrite my old x value. So after the first loop, it will be one, then it will be three, then it will be three plus four is seven, then it will be 12 and so forth till we have it all summed up. And if we look at our x value after, it's the sum of all the values from one through five, which is, which is 15. That's great, that's how we would do it in a regular programming language. In R we know that actually there is a function called sum and you just give it the values and, and that's way easier to, to do the same thing. But sometimes you want to do something really complicated and then you still have to write a loop that does all those steps if there's not a convenience function that already, already does it. <coughs> um, yes? If in the for loop uh, after the end we give it a vector that has a seven, three, and nine in it. So it has three elements, uh, seven, three, and nine. Mm -hmm. Then what is the value of i? Is it uh, mm -hmm. So, one, so if three, instead of, of one through five, you would say c for combine, and you said, what are the numbers? Uh, seven, three, and nine. Seven, three, and nine. Then i would have the value seven first, right, for the first iteration, so it would add seven to zero, so it's seven, right? Then for the second iteration, it would get three, right? So it would add it, so it's 10. And the last one is nine, so it adds, so your result would be nine. It would just like add up the values in this list back there, right? Would be the same as sum of three, seven, nine, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the sum is actually, it's not implemented in R code because that would be too slow, but that's really what the sum does. It calls some C code that basically it does this loop. Okay, let's look at this one. What does it do? It actually uses a list here. So as the sequence here, it takes a list and it says a is two, b is one to two, and c is four. And it says four i in this list. And now i will get the values of the list. So the first time it will get the value a is two here. So i will be two. The second time it will get the value one through two. So it's a list with one, or it's, it's, a, it's a sequence with one of two. And the fourth, third time it gets a four. And interestingly, the result that my for loop gets me is seven and eight. And the question is, how does that work? And why, why is it so? Maybe first, why is it two values and not one? Because, because B has two, two values? values because there's two values for B, right? And we know there's rules for recycling, right? If there's not enough values in a vector, then it will start repeating values, right? And that's what happens, right? And I think you, you know what's going on, right? So the first time X will get the value two, that's great. But then you want to add one and two to the value two, so you will get actually three and four. And then you have four, so you need to recycle four because you have to add it to both of them. So you have three plus four is seven, and four plus four is eight, and that's why you get two values here. If that's what you intended it to do, awesome, great for you. If not, then you need to look at the answer and say, I actually wanted one number, why is there two numbers, what's wrong with it, right? And then you need to figure out what's, what's going on in, in, in here. Okay, so far so good. While loop. There are while loops, I think, in the whole time that I use R, and that's now like 10 years or something, I think maybe once I used a while loop, if at all, and I used like a couple times a for loop, so you see how important those are really are in, in, in the real world, or at least in my world. Uh, and a while loop looks and works exactly like in other programming languages. Uh, if you never used a while loop, don't start with R using while loops. It's really not, really not worth it. There is, of course, break and next and all the things that you would expect from a regular programming language. But it, it is really not, not so great. And the reason is that, the most, or that most things that we want to do can be done vectorized anyway. So you can do all kinds of operations to hold vectors at the whole time. So why would you write a for loop that goes through each element and does it individually if you can do it to the whole thing anyway? Uh, and those loops also are really, really slow in R. So if you write code that has a for loop or a while loop in R and does something for 500,000 rows in your data set, it's going to take forever, right? So if you, for example, want to sum up the elements in, in each row in the data set and use the for loop, then it might take like, I don't know, three seconds. If you say sum, it's done in like two milliseconds, right? And that's really, it's, it's a factor of 100 or even more 
that's the difference. And it does the same thing. So don't even, I know lots of people, computer scientists, would like to think in this like everything is a loop in the world. But it's not. Try to avoid that, that kind of idea. OK, functions. And we, I think we did a, what was it, median average deviation function, something we had it in our set. So I need to tell you how to make functions. And functions, to create functions is really, really easy in R because all you need is a name for the function. For example, inc for increment. And I just made this up, this name, right? And then I just assign to it, similar to assigning a value, I assign to it an object that's a function. And you define it by the keyword function. Then you tell it what are the arguments to your function. In this case, it's just one that's called x. And then you have some code that does something with x. And whatever this code back here evaluates as the last value that it evaluates will be the return value. And that can be an individual value. It can be a list. It can be uh, uh, a vector. Um, there's actually also a keyword return. But it's hardly ever used because the last value that's evaluated in this block will be your return value anyway. OK, if I now say inc, which is the name of the function, and it tells me in inc there is stored something that's of type function. And that is the body of the function, and that's the argument. If you want to look at the mode, it says it's an object of type function. And functions are first class objects in R, which means you can pass on functions as arguments which in other programming languages is either not possible or very painful. If you pass on pointers to functions, I think you can do this in C++. In later versions of C++, I think you can pass on actually functions. So they became first class objects. Um, in R, they are always this. So you can take a function, pass it on to another function, and this function returns a function. Right? That can happen in your functional programming world. Okay. Now let's call this function. You just take the name and give it a value. So for example, if I say increment 5, then it spits out 6. Because the 5 goes into this x plus 1 is 6. So that's really not hard. If I give increment a vector from 1 to 10, then it uses the regular rules to add 1 to this vector. And you will get back a vector that's called 2, 3, 4, or has those values in there, right? Uh, and you can think about any type of object for which we have a definition what plus 1 means. It will work. So that's, that's pretty straightforward and it's pretty good for us. So we can make it a, a smarter function. We could get it, give it a by argument to increment by a certain value and a default value of 1. So if I say for this one, increment 5, it says 6. If I say increment 1 through 5 by 10, then you get 10 or 11, 12, and so forth. So it's pretty straightforward and easy to use. Um, you can use the arguments in the correct order, right? The first one goes to x, the second one to y. Uh, and if you don't believe in that, because you never remember in what order you implemented the arguments, then just use the name. And then it will reorder them correctly. It will always pass this 10 on to the y argument. Initially, I thought, well, that's nice, but not so important. But actually, after you implement 10 different functions, you will not remember in what order your arguments go in each function. So this is actually very, very helpful uh, for us. OK, and you can then have them even reverse, and it will still work if you give the arguments names. Um, since our increment works with anything for which the plus operator is defined, it also works with matrices, right? So I can give it a matrix 1 through 4 and increment it by 10, and I will get back a matrix that has those values incremented, right? Uh, so that's pretty nice, because you don't need to overload functions or do things for different data types. It will just like work out of, out of the box. And now the last thing, which is somewhat complicated. Yes? Uh, can you go back to the function, please? Sure. So you can see the function has one operation here. Right? Uh, here? And, right. So mm -hmm. what if I have like multiple operations? What mm -hmm. are the results going to return? Do, do, can I specifically mm -hmm. return the specific value that I want? Yes. OK. So this is just a single uh, 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 statement, right? But if you have several statements, you would just like in each line have a statement. And the last statement will evaluate in, in a certain value, and that's your return value. The last statement here is the only statement that you have. It, it evaluates in a value, and that's your return value. If you actually want to specifically say what the return value is, which typically is in a function the last value that you get, because why would you do other stuff that you don't need for your return value, uh, especially in functional programming languages where side effects are forbidden. Uh, since, since your last value is always what you return anyway, nobody really writes it there. But you can actually call a function called return. 
and give it a value and at that point it will stop the function and return exactly whatever this value here evaluates for. But it doesn't make sense to put code after the return statement because it's never gonna go there, right? But if you would have some, some conditional, if something returned this, if something else returned that, then you could use the return returns function. Yes? Is there a way to force or just to advertise that the, uh, the arguments passed in need to be of a certain type? Um, in, in the vanilla version that we have here, it's not. You, you, it's your job here in your code to check that, which can be painful, right? Because you would have here could ask, is x a vector? And then I do it. If it's not a vector, I don't want to touch it, right? Or if x could be actually a complex number. Do we know what incorrect is supposed to do to complex numbers? Do we know what it does? I guess for complex numbers, addition is defined, so it probably will do the correct thing. Because pi could also be a complex number, and then it would add the, the imaginary part and whatever. Uh, but if you want to check this here, then you, you have to check it. Uh, if you pass something on an X where plus is not defined, it will be just an error message. It will say, you know, you, you have a, I don't know, a list, and maybe addition with lists doesn't work. But say I was to you, I were to use someone else's function, mm -hmm. and uh, or if I were to write a function that someone else can use, you know, I publish mm -hmm. it. How do I tell the users while they're using the function that the arguments should be of a certain type? Mm -hmm. now, instead of checking it in the function itself, I just tell them this is what is expected. Okay, so I if you publish functions, then hopefully you do it in, so in a package and you will write a manual page and somebody will then say question mark my function and it will pop up and say, you know, x is supposed to be a vector and, and pi is supposed to, supposed to be a number and things like that, right? But you know, people not, don't always do what <laughs> you tell them to do, right? They might still pass on something else and just try just for fun what happens, right? So if you want to avoid that, then you have to really write an if statement here and say, if x is not a vector, then stop, which gives him an error message, and, and the message is, I don't know, don't do that, or something like that, right? But you really, like in other programming languages, you have to do your assertions, your checks uh, for, for, the, for the arguments in your code. Um, if you don't do that, often it just like fails with an error message, but chances are that the error message will be for the end user not understandable. It will just like, you, you put in something here and it will give you a message that plus is not defined for some weird class that they don't even know that they are using, right? So it's probably better if you write an error message here that tells them what the problem is. Okay. Apply. Yes. Seems it can't write the recursive function like. Recursive function? Yeah. I mean, I just use the function itself. In oh, oh, what happens if you use it itself? It seems it's, it's disabled. You can't do that, I think. Uh, to call it, oh, you, you, you can, in ink, you could call ink again, right? Yeah, you can't. I mean, but, but you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure that it's not infinitive, an infinitive, <laughs> because then it's not going to end well or at all. But you, you can call, your own function in here if you want to. You can just like say, for example, define ink as x plus ink of pi or something and it, it will do that. Um, for, for recursion, you probably need an if statement that, that conditionally at some point ends and then rolls back the recursion, otherwise it's not gonna happen. But recursion in functional programming languages works the same way as in, in, in regular programming languages. Okay, you will not use recursion or need recursion in this course, okay? <laughs> uh, apply and lapply. It's actually a whole family of apply functions. There's lapply, sapply, and just apply by itself. And all that it really does is it applies a function that you give it to all elements of some sort of, of data structure. For example, I can have a list here with uh, the sequence one through three, then six, and then the sequence seven to three. And I want to do something to all of them. For example, I want to reverse the order in those three elements in my list. If I just say reverse to my list, then it will just reverse the order here. And my first element will be seven through three, then six and one through three. That's not what I want. I want to reverse the order inside each element, right? So what I do is I do an L apply, which is a list apply, apply to each element in the list, the function that you define here is function. And the function that I define here is a function that gets as x the argument, 
and then it applies a function that is defined in R, which is reverse to each of them. LApply collects the results again back into a list and will give me the, the results. And we see it did it for the first one, it replaced, it reversed them. Second one, reversion doesn't do much to it, right? It's just one value, and then it reversed the last one as well. Okay, so that's what you would do if you have data in a list. Um, the reason why it's important for us is because most of our data comes in the form of a matrix or a data frame. And a data frame actually is a special type of list where each column is an element in the list. So if we would want to do something to each column in a data frame, we would actually be able to use LApply and say apply it to each column, for example, mean or something. Um, and that's why it's very useful for us. If something returns only one value for each function call here, then there is a simplification uh, uh, version of, simplified version of apply, which is sapply, which drops it down from a list. lapply always returns a list, drops it down to the smallest representation. In this case, it's just a vector. So for example, if I apply to this list here, the function length, function is the second argument, that's why I don't even need to say fun here but I could also say capitalized fun equals length. Um, then it will apply length to all three of those. So it will say three, one, and however many that is, five. It would actually give me back a list with one element, three, one element, five, one element, uh, one element, one, and one element, five. But since I say I want it simplified with S, it actually gives me back just one vector and says, you know, there's three elements. The first element is three long, the second element is one long, and the last element is five long. So that's, if you simplify a list into individual values for each list, then that's a very, very useful way to do it. Um, this function here is here. I actually define a function. I could have written this way easier. I could have written fun equals reverse, REV, and it would have worked as well. But I just wanted to show you that you can implement whatever function you want yourself, however complicated it is, in here as a function. Okay, so that's. L apply and S apply, that applies to lists. If you have a matrix, then you use apply by itself. And what it does is I have here a matrix that I create, a three by three matrix. I want to apply something to the matrix. And for a matrix, you can either apply it to rows or columns. So you could either look at each row as a vector and apply it to it, or each column as a vector and apply it to it. And margin is the argument that tells you, is it for rows or columns? They decided to use this as numbers one and two, which is not great. I would rather say margin is rows or margin is columns, but they just did one is rows and two is columns. If you don't remember, you can say question mark apply and it will tell you there. So this means it applies it to rows. And then here's the function argument. What is it supposed to apply? And this is the function sum, right? So this one will give me the row sums basically, the sums, the sum of each row. Um, and it's 12, 15, and 18. If I want it for the columns, then I just say margin is two and it will add them up column wise, right? So it's six, 15, and 24. Those functions are so important for matrices, row sums and column sums, because it's the marginals that you want to calculate, uh, that there's actually convenience functions where you just say row sums and column sums, but internally the implementation is really just calls this apply on here. Um, and that's really all there is about apply. And it is very useful because people would probably make, a, if you want a, from a matrix all the row sums. In a regular programming language, you would have to have a for loop that goes through all the rows and then a for loop that goes through all columns and adds it up, right? So you have a nested for loop, uh, which is kind of quite some effort. If you could get it like easily like this, you probably want to do it that way. Okay, last thing is exercises that you can again uh, do at home and we will go through those on, on first day and they should help you learn a little bit how to, how to make functions and how to use functions, how to use, use apply.